Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. We've all said this at some point in our lives, and that's, oh, don't worry about it. It's just my OCD. But I want to talk about what OCD actually is and how this can impact your life. Because It's not super common, but I suppose everyone to some degree maybe has a little bit of OCD tendency. So I want to define what OCD is, really talk about the statistics of OCD within the population, and then obviously what type of nutrients will be beneficial if someone has been diagnosed with OCD, or maybe you just think that you've got those pretty powerful OCD tendencies. So I'm Amanda Williams, MD, MPH. And let's get right to it. Let's talk about OCD. We know that obsessive compulsive disorder is a big issue for someone who has been diagnosed with this because people will experience these unreasonable, uncontrollable, or recurring thoughts followed by a particular behavioral response. And so when we think about the compulsions, that's the repetitive behavior. This is brought on by the obsession or the repeated thoughts or urges. And this can drive up a whole lot of anxiety for people who actually are dealing with this. And when we think about the acting compulsive behaviors. We look at things like, you know, checking to make sure that your coffee pot is turned off or that you locked your door. If you're, you know, repeatedly washing your hands, um, but not in a healthy way, in a obsessive compulsive way. This can get to the point where it really starts to impact people's social interactions. And then there can be the, the mental compulsions where maybe you're having to do, you know, certain counting or mental checking on certain tasks that you're doing each and every single day. And we know that it's not super common within the population, but it's certainly not rare either. OCD is estimated to affect anywhere from 1% to 2% of the U.S. population. So it's not categorized into that rare um, category, we can certainly see that that prevalence is, it's pretty widespread. It's roughly about one in every 40 U.S. adults and every one in 100 children in the United States have OCD. And so when we look at this, we can understand that many of these symptoms, usually the onset of this will happen earlier in life. So usually in childhood is when most of these signs or symptoms start to become more prevalent. And understanding the long-lasting impact that this can have, because we know that people who have OCD oftentimes have a co-occurring mental condition. So whether that's you know, major depressive disorder, whether that's anxiety or a panic disorder, um, or they you know, fall into the category where they have some type of a substance abuse condition. And this is certainly not unheard of. We know that many times, even in the spectrum of schizophrenia, oftentimes people say, oh, well, they're trying to self-medicate. Well, we definitely see this to be the, the same case when we're looking at OCD. So let's talk a little bit about OCD as a disease state itself and, you know, recognizing the different patterns, those signs and the symptoms. Clearly, we know that there's, you know, extreme levels of of anything. So if someone is, you know, constantly walking down the street and then they have to stop and turn around because they stepped on a crack and they have to go back and they have to recount it. I mean, these are clear indications of a more severe form of OCD. And this kind of gets categorized into that anxiety disorder spectrum. And we we know that 
there are certain things. Um, learning to deal with daily stressors can oftentimes help to mitigate many of the symptoms of OCD because the more stressed someone is, the more likely that these symptoms will start to appear. Now, when we look at different risk factors, you know, is there a genetic component? There hasn't really seemed to be anything that they can zero in on and say, yes, this is the direct causative reason for obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, is there a structural abnormality affecting a certain part within the brain? Is there a role that the different neurotransmitters are playing? All of these have been loosely associated with OCD, and we can certainly see, you know, serotonin implications as well as dopamine implications in patients who have OCD. We can also see how other hormones, things like estrogen, um, can impact OCD symptoms in both men and women, and that's important to, to recognize. So seeing these different things, and this is why many people who have OCD have been given the standard pharmacological treatment, which is usually SSRIs, or these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And for many folks who have OCD, they're put on a SSRI, and then they feel like, they're not getting any better. So we have to look at that complete environmental aspect of this. We have to look at the stress and how this can exacerbate OCD. We have to look at deficiencies in terms of different nutrients that may be triggering this. And understanding that this is very distressing for someone who has this and they become very embarrassed and they're you know, um, ashamed of their actions because they recognize that this is not normal. And that's the interesting thing is with OCD, this is one of those areas where people are very aware of the fact that the actions that they are taking don't make sense. And when we really start to break it down and you start to see how these patterns develop throughout the years and how this can become more and more progressive and start to incorporate more and more aspects of their life. This is why, hey, we need to get a hold of this. And there are many different things that we know just from scientific research can be very, very beneficial and helpful for someone who has been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. And you can look at the the different subtypes, you know, if we're getting into the um, psychiatry of OCD and you have the obsession of having excessive concern with things being in order. Um, and in that, the compulsion would be the counting or repeating a particular action. We know that there are the subtype where it's a cleaning obsession. So maybe this is a fear of dirt or germs or chemicals. And so this becomes the compulsion behavior of cleaning or wall washing all of the time. And then we can look at hoarding. This definitely falls into that category of OCD. And that is collecting or that failing to get rid of things. And that compulsion becomes the hoarding. And everyone's probably seen the TV show where you look and you go, oh my goodness, how do they live like this? And they, for the most part, understand that it's not normal, but they have such a difficult time coming to the realization that their state of mind has become so progressively um, compulsive that they almost become, in a sense, defensive about this. And like I said, this is usually because of that concurring comorbid condition of the anxiety panic disorder or that major depressive disorder. So all these things that we know certainly play a significant role. So, you know, they've done different neuroimaging and neurophysiology studies to try to look for abnormal activity within specific regions of the brain and really trying to localize the brain regions that are involved in OCD. But once again, this is oftentimes not conclusive because there are different subtypes of OCD.
And we can look once again at the abnormal activity of certain neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin in particular, and really seeing the dysregulation of these neurotransmitters and glutamate, which is a um, excitatory neurotransmitter. This has also been linked into the pattern or the implication of OCD. Looking at sex hormones and estrogen and progesterone and how these may be playing a substantial role in the obsessive compulsive symptoms. So all of these different things are why scientists are continuously trying to put their finger on what is creating this and how do we stop this from occurring? Because it really is um, a big problem. And for those who deal with this on a regular basis, they're just trying to get to what is considered to be normal. And, you know, this may require things like cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, This may require that they are on some type of a pharmaceutical agent. But oftentimes, what we know is that people who are put on the SSRIs usually don't have very good response to the medication. And so being that relatively few patients who have OCD actually feel like they go into any type of a remission, they oftentimes stop taking it because they're experiencing other side effects coming from those drugs. So we know that this is an issue. And we know that when we look at society as a whole, everyone, as I mentioned, can have a little bit of OCD. And I've done it myself where I I leave the house and then I go get in the car and say, oh, did I turn off the coffee pot? Now that's normal. I mean, we're all going to have these things, but it would be a problem if you had to go to the car, go in the house, check the coffee pot, go back out to the car, sit down in the car again and then say, did I turn off the coffee pot? And keep doing that process over and over. That's where it becomes disruptive to the normal brain functioning. So we can look at the different nutrients that have been linked in to being supportive to those who are dealing with this. And one of the most widely studied happens to be NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine. And many different um, double-blind placebo-controlled trials have shown that N-acetylcysteine can really make a significant impact for those who have been diagnosed with obsessive-compulsive disorder. There was a study that was done and published in the Journal of Clinical Psychopharmacology and Neuroscience back in 2015, where they were looking at the use of NAC in patients who have been diagnosed with OCD. So the way that they did this, they did a a meta-analysis where they populated all the data from multiple clinical trials, and they were looking at studies that lasted for at least 12 weeks in duration, where they were giving these patients anywhere from 2,400 milligrams upwards to 3,000 milligrams of N-acetylcysteine each day. And they wanted to see what type of results did all of these studies come to the conclusion on. And they found very encouraging results uh, that demonstrated from these different studies that the utilization of N-acetylcysteine was incredibly impactful to the diminishing of those obsessive compulsive behaviors. So we can look at this, we can say, okay, we know that SSRIs are generally the first line of treatment, and we also know that many of the patients who are given the SSRIs do not achieve any type of a true clinical response to these medications. And so they're always trying to find What is another alternative? Well, sometimes the alternative is right in front of our face, which is how can we enhance our natural glutathione levels? How can we fend off oxidative stress? And looking at how N-acetylcysteine is working on these multiple different mechanisms within the body, they started to, to say, maybe we should look at NAC as a potential treatment option. And looking at the efficacy of NAC in terms of the augmentation of OCD, um, once again, here's another study that was published showing the, the impact 
of NAC and how NAC really could add so much to the improvement, um, to the resistance and the control, to the compulsions in OCD. And they actually did this study in children and adolescents. Because remember, when we're looking at OCD, we know that the general onset of this is going to happen earlier in life. So the first thing, and then you could have a kid that maybe they have to line up all of their stuffed animals, and which is not uncommon for most kids to do. But when you see that pattern switch, that it becomes an obsession and a compulsion to actually do this. So clearly, if someone has OCD, they need to go and get evaluated by the appropriate physician, uh, usually a psychiatrist, to go through the clinical diagnostic criteria to see, you know, is this truly OCD? And if so, what can we be doing? Now, here's another really interesting find. When we think about NAC and just how NAC can be helpful, um, one of the first published studies with NAC was back in the early 2000s where they were looking at um, women with OCD and when they gave them N-acetylcysteine, how much of an improvement that they had. So from there, they you know continued with more and more of these clinical research trials and have since done a whole slew of trials with N-acetylcysteine. And each and every single one of those trials continues to kind of reinforce just how powerful N-acetylcysteine can be. And it's even outside of um, OCD. You can look at, you know, other issues where people are, you know, continuously pulling out their hair. Um, and that's a condition as well. And they find that those who are given NAC will have a significant improvement on diminishing these types of compulsive behaviors. And so you think about that and you think, wow, okay, just taking N-acetylcysteine, which we know already is so beneficial for our liver, so we start to think along that detoxification. Maybe is it that people who have OCD, their body's methylation process is not exactly working great, and maybe the toxicity starts to build up a bit, which is why some of those neurotransmitters and the different hormonal pathways are not working quite efficiently. So these are all theories that are out there to really kind of zero in on how it is that NAC um, can potentiate these powerful benefits. And we can see from the science that NAC really seems to be well tolerated in these patients and to boot really provides such a dramatic difference in terms of their daily life. Now, the other interesting find comes down to B vitamins and vitamin D. And in the Journal of Psychiatry Research, they found a link between B12 folic acid homocysteine, so that's going to be looking at inflammation. So once again, we're thinking about that methylation pathway. We know B12, as well as folic acid, have this direct correlation to the way that the body detoxifies and um, vitamin D levels. So they looked at children and adolescents who had obsessive compulsive disorder, and they started to draw this link. They started to see that those children and adolescents with OCD had significantly lower levels of vitamin B12, vitamin D, folic acid, but yet had high levels of homocysteine. So that inflammation was already occurring in childhood, which is really a, a big problem. So in the Indian Journal of Psychology, they were looking at OCD. And an early manifestation of that is brought on because of B12 deficiency. So they said, B12 is a cofactor for the synthesis of key neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine. Remember I said when they're looking at the pathophysiology of OCD, they always bring up the serotonin and the dopamine. And they said the B12 deficiency can affect the mood and the emotion and sleeping and all of these other things that we know B12 is essential for. So looking at B12 deficiency and 
understanding that that B12 deficiency was a kind of a stepping stone, that direct driver to the onset or to the development of these certain conditions, including OCD. So within this study, they really were able to zero in and recognize that B12 deficiency is a major driver to many of these different mood disorders because of the way that B12 is affecting the levels of these different neurotransmitters. So we can see the studies and they say, okay, well, B12, let's look at B12, let's look at folic acid, let's see if taking these nutrients can help to reestablish better neurotransmitter connectivity and release. And certainly this is what they've been able to show. And there are case reports that have indicated that patients with OCD who have B12 deficiencies, once they start to reestablish those B12 stores, they start to improve. So we can definitely draw on just basic things. We can look at NAC, we can look at B12, folic acid, vitamin D deficiencies. We know that our trace elements certainly play a role into the patterns of OCD. So when we're looking at things like uh, magnesium and zinc, we know that these play a role. We've even been able to see in anemia, for example, how this can be a driving force. So iron is playing a significant part into this as well. So any type of imbalance within trace elements, these trace minerals, can be associated with the pathophysiology of OCD. They've looked at this with selenium deficiencies. You have to have selenium in order to make glutathione. If we are lacking selenium, we can't make glutathione. So all of these different connections have been drawn upon. And while initially most of that research was really zeroed in on N-acetylcysteine, now they're starting to connect those additional dots and say, well, let's look at those vitamins and the minerals as well. So if the body is not producing adequate amounts of key neurotransmitters or the hormones aren't balanced and they start to reestablish these levels in the body, we start to create a lot more homeostasis or hence just overall balance. So that's kind of the overview of OCD. I wanted to give you a little insight into this. And remember, if you know someone who has OCD, do make sure that they are seeking out help from a professional. And, you know, it would be advantageous to have their B12 folic acid levels and their vitamin D levels assessed. Very, very beneficial. Can give you a lot of insight as to what is actually going on and when it comes to the nutrients that they can be taking, this is definitely a situation where they would want to speak to one of our nutritional experts and make sure that they are taking the right formulations at the right dose to really optimize and support their overall wellness. So that is all that I have for you for today. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Invite Health Podcast. Remember, you can find all of our episodes for free wherever you listen to podcasts or by visiting invitehealth.com slash podcasts. Do make sure that you subscribe and you leave us a review. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we will see you next time for another episode of the Invite Health Podcast. 